Hi guys, um, welcome to my Sunday live. Um, it is um, Sunday the 16th of May. Um, slightly um, wet, damp, a bit dreary <laughs> outside, a little bit grey as well. Um, but we need the rain um, because without the rain we wouldn't appreciate the, uh, the sunshine. So yeah, that's a very, very deep meaningful statement in there somewhere I'm sure. So welcome. Um, what do I have to share today? Um, a, um, a colleague um, who um, used to sort of work with um, in another um, type of work, she's not long left now, but she set up um, her own um, business um, very much focused on, hi Karen, on HR, in HR. And um, she'd um, recommended, she'd put some posts up on stuff that she's sharing. And one of them was um, a link to um, a YouTube um, video, um, a psychologist um, called Susan David. So I, I yeah, had, a, had a, a look and, um, and she had some really good stuff actually, um, this psychologist that she was sharing. And she has what I call this ongoing question, um, partly around what does it take for us to thrive and live our best life hi mandy um which is you know a, a real coaching type um question i think i mean it's a, a, a philosophy you know a life philosophy question in itself isn't it what does it take for us to thrive and live our best life one of the key things that she um was making reference to and talking about was um, what she calls the emotional range. And there are other words and phrases for that, some of which we all may be um, familiar with. So you've got emotional agility. Um, some people um, talk about emotional intelligence, which um, Daniel Goleman and various other people talked about for quite a number of years. Um, and in essence, it's talking about the ability um, to be aware of what we're feeling and, and not push it down or push it away. Now, what struck me about this was some of what I remember sharing um, in my last life, particularly from my journal, was very much around um, feelings in relation to um, a post I'd shared um, to my mum in, in the journal from April 2020, and then um, the same to my daughter. And I just want to remind us um, of what I actually um, shared just on that particular journal piece because I feel it's really relevant to what I want to sort of share a little bit more today. So I'd shared last time about, on my dear mum, I put, I feel a bit tired and lower in energy. Um, I think that when you're used to being the one that energises and inspires others, it can be hard at times to accept and acknowledge you need a rest. I know you always used to say about me setting an example to the others as I was the eldest. It does definitely set up a sense of responsibility for things. And then I noted some of the emotions that I'd put in this journal. So I'd put, I'm feeling a bit emotional as I'm writing this. Sometimes I feel emotional um, and I get annoyed with it. That's really interesting. I, I remember for a long time, I'm talking many years, when I used to get... Um, some level of emotions that I saw as being, you know, just getting in the way of me doing stuff or, or feeling okay about things or trying to communicate in some way. Um, I would get really racked off with it, really annoyed actually, to a point where the being annoyed about feeling certain things in itself became quite <laughs> an intense, you can imagine the irony of this, became quite an intense feeling. Um, and I went on to put in the journal, it's like, why am I feeling this? And I can't always put a reason to it. And I get annoyed for feeling that way. Almost like it gets in the way of me doing things. Rather than accepting, that's the way it is. And that's why I'm feeling. So just be with it. And then I went on to say, I'm not sure how we were really allowed to be with our own feelings growing up. Or whether we were really given space for certain feelings, maybe they weren't allowed. Um, hi Mel, I'm well, thank you. Um, it felt like feelings got in the way, or certain types of feelings, I think, got in the way. Um, and when I was then coming back to reflecting about what I was sharing this evening, um, I put here, 
that I remember saying I'm not really, um, I, I felt that we weren't really allowed to be with um, having space for certain feelings um, and particularly around annoyance, frustration, um, anger, sadness, that there was a lot of the feelings and emotions that I think we are often um, led to feel are, are not good or bad or negative um, in some way. And then when I also um, wrote the other page in the journal to my daughter, I then put, um, I noticed that you tried to stop yourself getting upset at times. And I know you said you find it hard to be with difficult feelings, like it's too painful. Even though I don't think I did this consciously, I wonder if I communicated some kind of message that feelings, feelings can get in the way um, or take up time. I know that when you showed signs of anxiety or panic, I could be with it for a while, but then I would notice I started to feel annoyed or frustrated because you didn't seem to be coming out of it quick enough. Um, and that would be hard then for me to try and stay calm internally. I think I'm in a better position to be with your feelings now much more than what I was before. And then in my own um, reflection here, um, I'm in, in my writing, um, I put here, I also recall um, in my journal page saying to my daughter, I might have communicated certain feelings that got in the way or took up time. Um, but there always came a point where I would struggle with my own frustration or impatience um, and maybe then try and rush in to stop you feeling a particular way as in my daughter or maybe um, offer a solution. And then I've gone on to say in the video that I was just making reference to this Susan David, um, it talks about how we can sometimes jump to solutions and fail to help others to see their own emotions as natural and healthy. And although we feel we're, we're trying to jump to a, a place where we're trying to offer help or maybe we feel you know bad about feeling that in ourselves and we're trying to do something about that, it doesn't always help the other person. And then I've gone on to say about, you know, whether we, those emotions and, and feelings are seen as bad or negative, like anger, sadness, grief and frustration. Mel says, my mum always used to say to me, why are you, what are you crying for? That's why I hide my emotions and feelings. It, it, it's, that's a classic, Mel, you know. It's like, because, the, you know, somebody like your mum was asking this question, well, why are you crying? What are you crying for? And because maybe she didn't quite understand what you were crying for, didn't quite grasp it, what didn't seem to be in her mind, I, I wasn't there, obviously, but, you know, she didn't quite understand what the logic was about that. And also, I suspect that, you know, like I was just saying, when people um, are adults, they don't always feel comfortable with somebody else's um, emotion. So if, for example, your mum didn't feel comfortable with that and that somehow and she couldn't be with it, then she might have then been asking that question, well, why are you crying for? What are you crying for? Um, but it's it's the, the message that when you're young, you you interpret behind something. So if, a, if an adult is actually saying, you know, why are you crying? Why are you crying? What are you crying for? It can have a bit of an underlying sort of unconscious message of it's not OK to cry. You know, what, what, what you, you haven't got good enough um, reason almost. Um, and it sort of it, it can make, you know, that young person feel it's not OK. And it can negate our own sense of, of what we're trying to, what we're experiencing at the time. When you're a lot younger, never alone when you're an adult, you, you can't always um, understand what it is you might be feeling or, or, you know, why you're crying. But the crying is your body's way. It's an outlet, you know, of, of trying to express and, and get rid of something. So I, I, I really can understand that, Mal. And as you said, while well, you hide your emotions and feelings because they, they perhaps weren't um, acknowledged, you know, in, in a way that was healthy at the time. But the important thing as well about that is to know that, you know, now, you know, we're, we're all adults. And so whatever you experience when you're younger, it's really important to be able to work through that and to be able to accept that you're not that child, you're not that young person anymore. And so actually... As an adult, you know, it's important for you to work through 
that emotion and, and begin to accept and know that there is nothing wrong with crying. It is okay for you to experience and, and feel what you're feeling and for, and for that to, to be okay as well. Um, and I've gone on to put here in my writing um, that this um, Susan David I was on about um, talked about when emotions are pushed aside, ignored or squashed, it becomes amplified. So the irony is you may think that you're in control, but and I'm sure we all know this, the pain has a way of coming out. This may also come out in the way we do other things um, to excess both ways. So, for example, somebody might put 100% focus into a relationship at the expense of anything and everybody else. Somebody else might go to excess in the way they exercise. Um, somebody else may do that in the way they overwork. Um, somebody else may do that in the way they restrict themselves to a minimum. So, for example, that might show up um, in the way somebody develops um, an eating disorder and is very controlled about their eating. Somebody else, it may show up, um, for example, by having um, a, a panic attack. So there are many different ways the the body will, you know, find a way of still br bringing out that um, that hurt somehow. But it's not always going to be in the most healthy way. And this this um, psychologist talked about she her dad died when she was about fifteen sixteen. And she said at the time, it was interesting, she recalls being praised by others around her for being strong. And she remembers that, that they people said phrases like, just be positive, um, grit through it, you'll come through the other end, um, everything will be fine. And although I'm sure, you know, those statements and comments from people around her would have been um, well-intentioned, um, and people were obviously trying to, you know, particularly 15, 16 year old, it must have been very difficult you know, for people to know what to say. But she was saying that sometimes we push aside our emotions and feelings and embrace what she called a false positivity. So we actually lose our capacity to develop skills to deal with the world as it is, not as we wish it to be. And she, she went on to say that you don't have to, um, you don't get to have a meaningful life and leave the world a better place without experiencing a range of emotions that may include um, all kinds of stress and discomfort. So it's really interesting, you know, her take on it was that you, you need to and have to experience some of these feelings and emotions that may feel uncomfortable if you really want to embrace life for, for all of its worth. Um, and Mandy's also saying, I was not allowed to cry. It's very, very... Um, quite damaging I think when you're young and your feelings and emotions are being shut down or and other people around you and can't be with that so for example when you're trying to shut down that crying um you, you you're cutting it off and and you're pushing it down and you you know it, it's but when you're younger it still it, it will manifest and it will hold um within your body so you know you could have tension you could have stomach aches panic attacks, um, you know, it may come out in some people like nervous rashes or somebody else might wet the bed. There's all sorts of ways that, that when you're younger, the tension will come up. If, you're, if you've got to cut, what I call cut off that emotion on some level, then it will come up even in another way as well. Um, and so she goes on to um, say, well, how can we begin to actually be able to to feel and experience, you know, a, a range of emotions and even be able to, to extend our, our resilience, our, our agility, our emotional intelligence and so on. And interestingly, one of the things she talks about is she had obviously a very insightful teacher, if it was going back to, you know, what we'd call secondary school, if you like, where um, they encouraged the, the class to do journaling and write about how they felt as if nobody else was, was was looking at it, you know, in a very, very honest way. And I know that a lot of, you know, yourselves who are watching this will know um, I write a lot. I write, you know, poetry as well. But I, I've, I've always um, expressed my myself and my 
my feelings, my thoughts, anything really um, by writing it down and journal it in some way. And what she was saying was um, when she actually wrote things down, she began to notice the conflict around what she felt she should be feeling and in turn what she then was actually feeling and experiencing. Um, so, for example, um, there was a point where she felt very bad for feeling um, guilt. Um, so, for example, around, um, you know, a dad dying and her still being alive. Um, and yet there were other feelings and emotions that she needed to be able to accept more. And then she goes on to talk about what we call accuracy of feelings and emotions, which was really interesting. So, for example, um, she says people might say things like, I'm angry or I'm stressed. Um, but this can label our feelings. For it's an interesting point, without accurately looking at what's underneath. So we can be quite quick to jump there. So I do, um, on some of the other work I do with some of the anger management that I do, um, I get them at some point to really look at what's underneath this this statement of anger itself and and really you know unpick the the feelings and the emotions and there may be other things like i'm disappointed i'm hurt i'm feeling rejected i'm sad i'm lonely so you're really getting you know to, to a much deeper place about what this is really about what's really going on because some of the initial surface like of, of stress or anger and how that comes out may not really be the stuff that's really going on underneath. Um, Karen, I was told only silly people cried yet again. The message is that it's really fascinating, I think, that, you know, as, as adults, we're sort of sharing about what we experienced um, when we were younger. Really, it, it's very telling, isn't it? It has a massive impact on, on how you go into adulthood and how you express and feel your emotions um, especially when I couldn't say why I was crying and yes I did have panic attacks it's, this is just so pertinent to, to what we're really sort of talking about here absolutely um, and and also so highlights the importance then of having you know not only our own emotional um, agility and our own sense of what we feel and what we experience and being able to understand that and, and being able to communicate that but how much more importantly can we also encourage and, and enable other younger people, whether it be your own children, whether it be grandchildren, whether it be young people you work with, you know, other young people you come into contact with through friends, family members. I think there's, there's something really, really massively important here, but a really important message um, about enabling, um, you know, young people to be able to feel um be with and express that so that it doesn't really um yeah it doesn't take hold in an unhealthy way later on in life um and it, this is interesting as well i've put here um so also something that, that this um psychologist was talking about was she noticed that when people say i am i'm angry or i'm sad it can sound as if you're all of that emotion in its entirety, a bit like you're labelling it, so it, it's all, like all consuming, so I'm sad, I'm angry. Whereas the emotion is a piece of information that's telling you something. So talking about changing language, I, I mean, I've, I know some of yourselves as well, I think I work with language, and it's quite important to develop what I call that flexible language and the flexibility with your emotions at the same time. So what she talked about was changing the language slightly and, for example, saying, I'm noticing I'm feeling sad. I'm noticing that I'm feeling insecure um, so that it has a bit more of a I'm, I'm, I'm still feeling it and I'm noticing it, but I'm a little bit more detached from it. It's like I'm a little I'm a third person. I'm sort of observing it a little bit more. And, and by allowing yourself to begin to do that you know, it helps develop more flexibility um, and more curiosity in, in how you look at it and how you're considering it. And this reminded me that um, with some of the, the work I do, um, I use like a, a breathing um, log or a, a body scanning journal, I call it as well. And 
what I do is get people to just do brief scoring, um, not to 10, not is the most calm in the world, to 10 being, you know, absolutely about to explode. And then get them to do a real, a scanning from, you know, we're talking through, all the way from the top of your head, right the way through to all the extremities of your body, you know, sort of face, chest, back, through to your legs, and, and all the way down to your, your feet. And then what I do is there's a, a middle panel in the, the, the journal that they write in where I then ask them to notice and write down. So what did you notice about your feeling? Where was it in your body? Um, how do you know you're feeling that way? What information are you gaining that's telling you that? And, and in essence, you know, tell me more and yourself, more importantly, about, you know, why you're giving it that score. Um, and then basically in, in, in a nutshell they're in a better position then to ask themselves what is my emotion telling me um and 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 perhaps at that point um you know maybe they're able to then consider moving into what other actions um both short term and long term does the person need to begin to take but it really is it's quite a um a discipline to really get into um, this piece about what this really means, Carol. And that's why um, I was um, snapped at Neil Wood when he came to see me after John's dad passed away, as I did not want to cry. Um, it's good coach gave me permission to let go. Thank you. That's really kind, Karen. Really, um, really thoughtful and and giving you know real feedback there. I mean, that's that's really wonderful, isn't it? That what you're saying is actually when somebody gives you full permission to be and to be able to express your emotions and feelings however you know they come out that actually that enables you to be with your own self because that's what we're really talking about we're saying if somebody enables you to be that way and they see you I mean really see you then you can begin to feel more comfortable in your own skin and, and see yourself as well um let's just put thank you Karen but you realize you didn't need permission anymore and well, actually, yeah, what I would say there is it's ultimately it's about giving ourselves permission. But sometimes to give ourselves permission, we, we do need to have that role modelled. Um, so I, that, that's I guess that's what was happening there as well. I think that's really important. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so goes on to say this then develops the emotional agility to be with your emotions with and I love the phrase curiosity and compassion for ourselves because I think that's the piece this thing about what we, a number of us were re making reference to earlier on about the emotions that just just you interpret it in, a, in another way when somebody's shutting down the emotions the feelings you know the the you know you don't cry you can't do this you can't do that and we end up then internalizing it and becoming quite angry with ourselves and then we have all these other beliefs and thoughts that develop which end up um, not being compassionate to ourselves at all. But what happens is we end up being really hard on, on ourselves, never alone on other people, um, because we're frustrated and annoyed and angry and have almost internalised, well, you know, something wrong with me, something I, I have done wrong or um, something I, you know, I, I can't do, I can't express myself in, in an appropriate way. So I, I think this then piece about developing the acceptance and, and the compassion um, is, is massively important. And I've just written here, we can do that. We've then got more compassion for others and more space to be with other people's range of various emotions. So that's my, my, my sort of key piece about what I, really, I, want, to, I want to focus on today. Um, I'm actually going to just so you, you're aware, if anybody else is, you know, is also watching this, um, my next live, I'm also going to be still continuing this piece about the emotions and the feelings, but really also looking at how it can connect um, within generations and families and unconscious messages that I think, um, you know, often we're not always perhaps that, that aware of that we end up picking up as well. But that's for another another moment. So I've, the thing I wanted to sort of make reference to is some um, questions. I think most people who know me know I really, I like putting questions out there, questions that make you ponder, make you reflect. Um, I put a question, you know, nearly every week 
um, on the, the courageous coaching um, sort of group sometimes I'll put them on um, you know the page as well and it got me sort of thinking about well what makes a great question um, you know how we phrase things makes us look in very different places and this week um, amongst other sort of people I've been working with um, I was coaching um, a, um, a deputy head of, it's actually of, um, a reception, primary school, so really young children they're working with. And I just, I love this. He, he was basically saying that in this particular school, they actually introduce um, the subject on the, you know, be quite big on the curriculum. Um, they introduce um, philosophy for children at a really young age, which I think is fantastic. And he was saying that, they use um, as a real focus, you know, a lot of open-ended questions to enable reflection more than looking for specific answers, which I think most of us generally end up experiencing um, in education, that you're, you're being asked to look for, come up with the right answer, as opposed to encouraging you to explore, you know, the learning and, and, and for learning's sake. And it says here, um, I've put... It can really help when you're thinking about, you know, expanding open ended questions. It can help expand a young person's mind. It can develop curiosity. Um, it helps them question, think more for themselves. So they're not so rigid. Um, don't take things on so much as facts or at face value. They're really open to listen both to themselves and, and to other people's ideas as well. Um, and I won't go into detail, but actually, this also connected a little bit when I was. Um, talking um, earlier on um, my partner about this idea that you know the ability to have um, a healthy debate and healthy conversations without feeling it's got to become a you're right I'm wrong or vice versa or you've got to force your ideas on somebody to a point where um, if there's something that you don't agree with or vice versa then you know the, the, currently I mean both social media social media you know I, th I find that happens a lot and in general society um you can get a lot of nasty um comments and responses and and from people if you're not basically sharing you know an opinion or a view that they share you know where it can get quite vicious and and, and yeah and we were talking about it. it's like hold on a minute you know what happens to just being able to have open um healthy conversations that don't end up having to you know be nasty and yeah turn into a battle of of wills if you like so that's just just a, something that came out of other conversations around this so i'm going to share um a couple of questions with you um to sort of ponder on if you like and I'll say you know take away of you to to think about um so first question for you is what can you do today you were not capable of a year ago so what can you do today you were not capable of a year ago i quite like that one because i think that really helps you think about you know where where not only where you've come from but that sense of you know what what have you um what can you do now you couldn't do then and so how has it helped you grow and develop um for me i mean the classic most obvious i'm sure for other people is um I definitely can do way more um, um, on, you know, sort of video, social media, Zoom. My digital skills have, have really sort of ramped up. So I can definitely do a lot more of that, you know, that I wasn't as capable um, of a year ago, certainly. Um, another question for you. Have you done anything lately worth remembering? I like that question because I just think basically... If you read it, if you well, you hear it and you answer it and you go, oh, you have to think quite long to be thinking, hang on a minute, have I really done anything that's worth remembering? Then it may be worth questioning what you're actually doing. You know, it's like maybe you need to do more of something, something different um, to, yeah, something that's going to have more impact in, in a way on your own life. Um, there's another question which links quite nicely to what I was saying earlier on about impacting on young people if you could choose one book as a mandate to reread for all teenagers which book would you choose i quite like that actually um i think um 
Oh, I'm a bit torn actually. There's one, there's my co-active coaching one, which I think is just fantastic. It's got so many wonderful skills in. But I'm also a bit torn between um, that and the, the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and Kessler one, which is around, um, it's called the life lessons. Um, you know, what, what, what we can sort of learn about our own mortality, but offers us in life now, you know, rather than waiting till the end of our lives. So I think that one might come to me. And the other question, which sort of links, but is a little different, is if you could instill one piece of advice in a newborn baby's mind, what advice would you give? Ooh. If you could instill one piece of advice in a newborn baby's mind, what advice would you give? Well, based on, interestingly, what we're in, what's sort of being shared here at the moment, some of the comments that were being made, um, hmm, I think I'd, I'd quite like it to be um, be accepting of all of your emotions um, and feelings. Um, yeah, be accepting of all of your emotions and feelings, and they're all of worth. They all have value. They all have something to to tell you got something to teach you there's a there's a message in all of them you know they're all worth um noting so i think that would be mine um oh karen's put a book um you are born to succeed by colin turner well thank you karen i have to say my my very big <laughs> often expanding um personal library that's actually um one that i don't i don't have i don't think um so, yeah, that's given me um, something to think about, maybe for a bit later on, because I've got a couple of other books that I'm, I'm, I'm reading at the moment. So thank you for that. Um, now, I've got um, my couple of words for the day and um, maybe a random fact as well. So, um, I'm going to read, and I've heard this, this word before, but I just think it's quite a nice one. Panache, panache, and the meaning it says is a confident, stylish manner, also swagger, and a tuft of feathers on a headdress, such as a helmet or hat. And the etymology is from French panache, from Italian panaccio, from Latin pinaculum, which also means small wing. And diminutive of pinna, which means wing or feather. Ultimately, from the Indo-European root pet, which means to rush or fly. Which also gave us feather, petition, compete, perpetual and helicopter. And I just, I just love this idea of panache. Um, with, for some reason, when I think of panache... What comes to mind for me is suave, um, sophistication, <laughs> an air of. And um, if I also remember rightly, I'm, I'm sure, don't quote me on this, but I've got a feeling that there was a perfume by Avon called Panache as well. That, that sticks in my mind for some reason. So, yeah, that's my, um, that's my word um, for the, the day, the week. Um, panache. I quite like saying it as well. P panache. So, um... Random facts. You ready for random fact, guys? The M's in M and M's stand for Mars and Murray. M U R R I E is how that's spelled. That would be Forrest Mars and Bruce Murray, the two businessmen who created the candy coated chocolates. The two actually had a very contentious relationship, as Mars leveraged Murray, or Murray or Murray out of his 20% share in the company in 1949, years before M&M's would become the best-selling candy in the US, paying him just one million just for a share of business that would quickly be worth billions. I, I never knew the, the sort of history, if you like, behind the M&M's. And another random fact for you, the human body literally glows. It might be hard to see with your naked eye, but everyone you pass by every day 
is literally glowy. The human body emits a small quantity of visible light. Visible in the technical sense, the illumination is about 1,000 times less intense than levels of light that we would actually be able to see. Researchers in Japan used a special camera to track the glow and found that it fluctuates throughout the day, with the body emitting its lowest levels of light around 10 a.m. and highest at around 4 p.m., a rhythm the scientists attribute to the changes in one's metabolism. And I'm sure many of you out there have got a lot more thought and ideas and information um, behind actually what, what that can mean for us as human beings. But I just found that was really interesting. Um, you're going to love this. My last random fact for you. Get this cotton candy or what we might call candy floss. Do you know it was invented by a dentist? <laughs> it is not known whether William Morrison had an ulterior motive for inventing the soft confection. But the dentist no doubt helped ensure others in his profession continued drawing in plenty of customers. In 1897, he partnered with candy maker John C. Wharton to develop the cotton candy machine, which at the time was known as Fairy Floss. And it's been bringing kids cavities ever since. I, I'm, I've just thought that was hysterical. It's fascinating that a dentist <laughs> created that so yeah there's my uh, random facts for you um so i'm going to um read my um poem from myself um and then also um one from um another book i've got as well candy floss cotton wool <laughs> i love that karen um and then i'll um i'll do my um my song as well so just get to so i'm going to read my um, my poem first. So the one that I want to read to you this week, it's called um, Listen to Me. Noise, incessant noise, the bang, 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 tap, 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 droning on and on and on, gyrating noise, irritating like a little bug in your ear, an annoying fly that won't go away, flick, smack, swipe, and just when you think it's gone, it's back. Back with a vengeance, the ongoing drone, on and on and on. Starting slowly, quietly, whispering in your ear little by little, growing, morphing, enveloping, sucking the life out of you, until... You have to listen, because only listening will shut it off. Only listening will quieten the noise. To acknowledge it, to accept it, to give it the time and place it deserves. Until it is satisfied, you have listened and learned. Until the next time. So that was called Listen to Me. And then I'm going to share um, one. I've got this um, this book called Boyana Sampson. Um, she's fierce, brave, bold, and beautiful poems by women. And um, I'm going to uh, read one which is by Maya um, Angelou, which I'm sure some of you have heard before. And it's titled, Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? 
Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak, that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. And that's by Maya Angelou. And that's a beautiful poem. So, those are my, um, my poems. So, I have... Um, a song as always for this week so please feel free to sing along with me I can't see what on earth you're doing so feel free to <laughs> jump around run around do whatever you want to do guys I can't see ya somebody else might but I can't <laughs> so are you ready Take oh. a bar of chocolate, please. It's for my mum. Well, that was an advert. Chocolate for the mum. You probably start when you can hear it coming in. Some people might sort of recognise the introduction. A man who's sadly not with us anymore, like a lot of the good ones. Well, I guess it would be nice if I could touch your body. I know not everybody has got a body like you. Ooh, but I gotta think twice before I give my heart away. And I know all the games you play because I play them too. Ooh, but I need some time off from that emotion Time to pick my heart up off the floor Oh, when that love comes down with a devotion Well, it takes a strong man, baby, but I'm showing you the door Faith, 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 I gotta have faith Cause I gotta have faith, for faith, for faith I gotta have faith, for faith, for faith Baby, I know you're asking me to stay Say please, please, please don't go away You say I'm giving you the blues Maybe you mean every word you say Can't help but think of yesterday And another who tied me down to love the boy rules Before this river becomes an ocean Before you throw my heart back on the floor Oh baby I've reconsidered my foolish notion Well I need someone to hold me But I'll wait for something more Have faith Ooh, I gotta have faith Yes, I gotta have faith, for faith, for faith I gotta have faith, for faith, for faith This river becomes an ocean Before you throw my heart back on the floor 
Oh, baby, I've reconsidered my foolish notion. Well, I need someone to hold me, but I'll wait for something more. Cause I gotta have faith, for faith, for faith. Oh, gotta have faith. Yes, I gotta have faith, for faith, for faith. I gotta have faith, for faith, for faith. Ah, there you go, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I was singing it. <laughs> lots of love, lots of smiley faces. Uh, can't beat a little bit of George Michael, can you guys? Absolutely wonderful. Um, and actually, something in those words, I reckon. Yep, yeah, gotta have faith. Definitely gotta have faith in, gotta have faith in something, um, no matter what that is. So, yeah, just sort of, I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Karen. Really, really lovely kind words from you all. Have the rest of a of a great week. Um, if you want to contact me, please feel free. You know how to get hold of me. Um, Facebook, email, you know, phone, whatever. Um, and if there's any way I can help you or support you um, or somebody else, you know, then yeah, please just, um, just give us a shout. Thank you, guys. Lots of love, take care, and I shall hopefully um, see you all, if not before, next week. Take care, bye, bye.